Tony DeWitt here, Missouri appellate attorney, retired. None of what follows is legal advice. I'm here to do some video for you today to talk about an interesting subject on the law, and here it is. The legendary P.T. Barnum is said to have explained that no one ever went broke underestimating the taste of the American public. I think he chose the wrong thing that was being underestimated. My phrasing of that statement would say no one ever went broke underestimating the intelligence of the American public. No matter how many stupid people you think there are, there are more. We have to look no further than the challenges that have come out of TikTok to understand this. Consider, for example, a challenge that was based on consuming an overdose of a common antihistamine with antitussive effects. In other words, it dried up your mucus and it kept you from coughing. But probably the most significant side effect of that drug is that it was sedating. It was one of the most sedating of the antihistamines. Well, recently that challenge encouraged TikTok viewers to take overdoses, as I said, and try to experience a high or hallucinations. Public service announcement. If you are experiencing hallucinations, your brain is being injured. You probably shouldn't be doing that. But again, people who took on this challenge, they must have been a few cookies short of a dozen. That's what I'll say. The problem is that in excessive amounts, some of these things can cause heart problems, they can cause neurologic problems, you can go into coma, and you can die. But in spite of all of the warnings that are on the product labeling, and in spite of all of the common sense that you would think people would have when it says, you know, take two teaspoons every six hours and you're drinking a bottle of it, well, as you might guess, there were chuckleheads who tried this, and as you also might guess, there were some untoward complications for them after they did. And I'm being a little bit vague here because I don't want people running out looking these up and trying them. Uh, my job is not to promote anything like that. My job is to prevent people from ever doing something stupid like that. Then there were people who basically played with other people's hair and injured them in the process. And I, you know, I can't believe that somebody would allow someone to do what was done. And because if you came up to me and you grabbed a hold of my hair and pulled on it the way this particular challenge went, I'd probably be entering the threaten to hurt you challenge. I probably wouldn't hurt you, but I'd certainly give you a talking to. Some TikTokers tried what's called the silhouette challenge, where they took off their clothes and, like actors in the full Monty, were silhouetted against a bright red light. Not really dangerous, but red can be filtered with modern video editing software, and some of the participants were aghast to see their unclothed bodies displayed for all the world to see when others downloaded their TikTok videos, edited them, and then re-uploaded those videos. Ouch! That had to hurt, especially since you knew you did it to yourself. As bad as all of those were, they were nothing like what happened in the case we're discussing today. The case revolves around a tragic event and raises critical legal issues concerning social media, social media platforms, the responsibilities of technology companies, and, and one of my favorite pieces of legislation, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. The case is Anderson versus TikTok Incorporated and ByteDance Incorporated. It was decided by the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit in 2024. The primary legal issue is whether TikTok can be held liable under state law for recommending harmful content specifically a dangerous online challenge that resulted in the death of a minor, or if TikTok is protected by the immunity provided under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. If you're 18, 19 years old, and you take up one of these challenges and you wind up injuring yourself, you know, that's bad. But if you didn't realize what the risks were, at that age, 
then you're probably never going to be <laughs> suitable to be out in public with. This case involves a 10-year-old girl named Nyla Anderson who tragically died after attempting to replicate a viral TikTok challenge. I won't mention the name of the challenge because I would never want anyone to be encouraged to try it. The name of the challenge really isn't important. What's important is how it affected Nyla. Nyla saw a video depicting the challenge on TikTok's For You page. They call it the FYP page, a curated feed generated by TikTok's algorithm. After attempting the challenge, Nyla accidentally suffered fatal injuries. Nyla's mother, Tawina Anderson, filed a lawsuit against TikTok and its parent company, ByteDance, alleging that the platform recommended dangerous content to her daughter and failed to take appropriate measures to prevent the, the spread of such content, which ultimately led to Nyla's death. The district court dismissed the case under the Communications Decency Act, Section 230 Immunity Clause. Anderson appealed to the Third Circuit. Anderson, representing her daughter's estate, argued that TikTok was liable under state tort law for negligence and strict products liability. Her key points were these. TikTok's algorithm actively recommended harmful content to a minor. In other words, it exercised editorial judgment about where videos suggesting dangerous practices would be viewed. I want to give it a shout out here to YouTube because if you recommend these kinds of things here with your videos, you're going to be demonetized, as you should be. She also said that the company was aware that the challenge posed significant risks, yet it took no meaningful steps to stop its spread. In fact, by curating it to children in Nyla's age group, they magnified the danger of the content. Because, as we all understand, 10-year-old children do not have the judgment that older people have. A kid who's 18, 19 years old, okay, it's on them. They're adults. But a kid of 10 years old, to provide that person with content that was like this, I think is unconscionable. By recommending this content to Nyla, TikTok created an unsafe product. It's video feed that directly caused Nyla's death. The Chinese companies, TikTok and ByteDance, argued that they were protected under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which provides immunity to online platforms from liability for content posted by third parties. Before we get to that, let's explain what that immunity is. If I post a video here and it causes someone to do something that hurts them, I am responsible, not YouTube, because all they're doing is hosting it. But of course, I wouldn't do that, and more importantly, YouTube wouldn't send it out if it recommended dangerous practices. But the immunity is there to protect YouTube from liability for hosting my videos. That's its purpose, because YouTube cannot be blamed for simply hosting my videos. There are free speech concerns at issue here, and it is, um, I think, sometimes a fine line. The Chinese companies contended that TikTok is an interactive computer service under Section 230, which shields the platform from being traded as a publisher or speaker of third-party content. And they said the video showing this challenge was created by a third party. And TikTok can't be held liable for merely hosting or recommending it via its algorithm. The Third Circuit's decision was nuanced. The Third Circuit reversed, vacated, and remanded the lower court's decision, ruling that TikTok was not entirely shielded by Section 230 in this case. It held that while Section 230 grants some immunity for third-party content, it does not fully protect TikTok from liability arising from its own algorithm's recommendations. The court reasoning hinged on whether TikTok's algorithm constitutes first-party speech or merely facilitates third-party content. The court acknowledged that TikTok's algorithm curates content tailored to each user, making editorial judgments about what to show, which goes well beyond mere hosting of third-party content. The court cited a recent Supreme Court case, Moody v. NetChoice, which recognized that when social media platforms make editorial choices about the content they recommend, 
this can be considered their own expressive activity. Because TikTok's algorithm proactively recommended the challenge to Nyla based on its understanding of her demographics, meaning age, sex, race, ethnicity, and her preferences, other videos that she watched, the court held that this recommendation constitutes TikTok's own speech and is not fully protected by Section 230 immunity. The court distinguished between TikTok acting as a passive host of third-party content and actively promoting content through its algorithm. Since the lawsuit targeted TikTok's promotion and recommendation of dangerous content, rather than just the hosting of third-party videos, the platform could potentially be held liable under state law for its role in Nyla's death. This case is significant because it highlights the evolving responsibilities of social media platforms in light of algorithm-driven content recommendations. While Section 230 provides broad immunity to tech companies, courts are beginning to question the extent of that immunity when platforms play an active role in curating and promoting content. The decision suggests that platforms may be held liable for harm caused by the content they promote, especially when they target vulnerable users such as minors with dangerous or harmful material. The impact is likely magnified by the fact that many of the computer hosting services like Facebook, X, Instagram, and Rumble use algorithms to put content in front of their users. At what point does an algorithm, which is really just a set of protocols embodying policy choices, cross the line from automated filtering into first-party speech? We know that here it did. But how would this precedent affect a situation where, for example, you had someone on YouTube promoting a boycott of a product and a manufacturer was injured by that boycott? And how will this lawsuit affect hosting platforms' use of algorithms to promote their content? And what role is content moderation, like demonetization, for example, going to play in that discussion, since when a video is demonetized, it is by its very nature an editorial decision based on content, not merely hosting? The opinion has created a great deal of uncertainty in this regard. In summary, Anderson v. TikTok challenges the boundaries of Section 230 immunity in the context of modern algorithms. The court's ruling underscores the need for greater scrutiny of how social media platforms curate content and the legal consequences of their recommendations. As technology continues to evolve, so too must our understanding of how laws like the CDA apply in this digital age. And one more important editorial note here. The Chinese defendants have sought an en banc review from the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, but to this point it has not been granted as far as I'm aware. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any comments, drop them in the comments down below. Like, share, subscribe, all those things we always ask you to do. If you want, you could certainly email me with your contents at the address there. And if you would, take a moment do something nice for somebody. Display a little kindness. You'll do a good thing that will keep on doing good things. And come on back tomorrow. We'll talk about something else and have some more fun. Hey, as I said at the beginning, none of what I said is legal advice. But let me tell you what, the stuff that's going to be right up here, these are the things that YouTube thinks you might be interested in going forward. Have a terrific day.